Hello, my name is Sean, also known as Caio, and this is how to install Arch Linux. This tutorial will be utilizing the new installation script and ISO image that was released on July 15, 2012. Following the Arch Linux philosophy, this tutorial is geared at being simple and efficient. Okay, let's begin. You should now place your copy of the Arch Linux image you burned to a disk in your machine and reboot. If you need to enter BIOS to enable booting from a disk instead of the primary hard drive, please do so at this time. Now you should be looking at the Arch Linux boot menu. From this menu, select the boot option that corresponds to your architecture type, i686 for 32-bit, and x86 underscore 64 for 64-bit. Given that I have a 64-bit machine, I will choose boot Arch Linux x86 underscore 64. Your system will now begin the boot up process. Once finished, you will be greeted by the console. You may also notice that you have been automatically logged into the root account. In order to fully install Arch, we will have to first set up the hard drives, then establish an internet connection, then install the base system, then install the bootloader, and finally configure the system. Please note before we begin, if you are using a keyboard with a non-US key map, you will need to specify which key map to load before continuing. To do so, you first must look up the name of the key map associated with your country and keyboard. A list of all the key maps can be found inside the forward slash USR, forward slash share, forward slash KBD, forward slash key maps. If you take the name of the key map file, without the file extension, you can then plug it into the command load keys. For example, to load a key map for the United Kingdom, you would use load keys, space UK. First, we will start by setting up the hard drive we will be using for the Arch installation. You can get a list of all the disks in your system by performing the fdisk space dash l command. You can safely ignore the three on the bottom that begin with forward slash dev forward slash mapper as those are mounted from the live disk image you are using and are not physical drives. Once you have located the drive you will be using for Arch, make a note of the name the disk uses. In my system this happens to be forward slash dev forward slash sda. If you are installing Arch in a dual boot configuration with Windows already installed on one of your disks, you can easily locate this by looking for the disk or disks that contain HPFS slash NTFS slash EXFAT partitions. Now that we have located the disk we will be installing Arch to, issue the cfdisk command on said disk. Now as far as partition information for Linux goes, this tends to be one of those areas where everyone has their own opinion on how things should be laid out. I for one am a firm believer in the fact that hard drives have taken us to a point where a lot of this ceases to matter. That being said, there are certain circumstances that would allow for different partition setups, on a server for example. Given that this guide is for installing Arch onto a workstation, partition setup should be simple. To do this, I will walk you through setting up a couple partitions, one for root, one for boot, and one for swap if needed. Some would recommend creating a separate home partition, as this tends to be the bulk of where the user data gets stored. This can be useful, that is if you don't use separate drives, a file server, network attached storage, or some other means for your storage. I tend to use the latter, because it tends to be less operating system specific, and suits my needs better. To navigate around CFDisk, use the left and right arrow keys to select a command, and you can use the up and down arrow keys to select which partition and or the free space. Let's put this into action. You should see cfdisk with a single line in the table saying your disk is all free space. If this is not the case, and you had previously used this disk for something else, first confirm that this is indeed the disk you wish to wipe before continuing. If you are positive that this is the disk you want, select each existing partition, one at a time, and use the delete option. Now that we have a blank partition table, let's begin. First let's make the boot partition. Select new. Make it a primary partition. Tell it to size to 1024 megabytes, and place it at the beginning of the free space. You will then notice the new partition selected. Make this a bootable partition by choosing the option Bootable. You should notice under the Flags column that partition receives the flag Boot. The next partition is Swap. If you have a beast of a machine with, say, more than 8 gigabytes of RAM, this partition can be skipped. It's entirely up to you. Keep in mind, however, that if you are going to be using Suspend to Disk, better known as Hibernation, a swap file is required and recommended to be at the minimum the size of your RAM. 
If you choose to use a swap partition, reselect the free space and create another new partition. Make this one a primary partition as well. Size it to the amount desired and create it at the beginning of the free space. Then with the swap partition selected, move the cursor to the type option and select 82 Linux swap slash Solaris, which should already be selected. Now we can create our last partition. Move down to the free space and choose new. Also make this one primary. And for the size, you can go ahead and just press enter to select the rest of your disk space. Please note that if your machine uses UEFI, you will most likely need another partition to host the UEFI system partition. Please see the link in the description for more information on how to create a UEFI system partition. Now that your partition information is complete, make sure you choose the Write option to write the changes to the disk. Make sure you actually answer with YES as opposed to Y, as the letter Y is not an option. Then choose Quit to return to the console. Now that we have a partition table written to the disk, we can move on to formatting the partitions into file systems. In order to do this, we will be using the MKFS command. In order to get a full list of all supported file systems, type in the console MKFS and then press the Tab key. For use in Arch, we will be utilizing the ext4 file system. Yet before we begin, let's pull up a list of our partition tables for each disk to make sure we issue these commands on the proper disk. To do this, issue the command fdisk space dash l. You should notice the lines that contain the partitions we created. These names will vary depending on the disk you are installing to. As mine is SDA, the partitions I need to format are SDA1, SDA2, and SDA3. First, if you created a swap partition, issue the command mkswap on the device node of the swap partition. Then we can enable paging to the swap file by issuing the command swap on on the device node. You can verify that this took place by issuing the swap on space dash s command. You should see the partition you designated as swap in the list. Moving on to the remaining partitions. Both of these, as mentioned before, will be formatted using the ext4 file system. Issue the mkfs.ext4 command on each partition to create the file system. Now that we have prepared all the partitions and file systems, let's mount them to a temporary directory. First mount the root partition, which should be the last one we created. Issue the command mount space forward slash dev forward slash sda3 space forward slash mnt, substituting sda3 with the partition you created last. Then create a directory for the boot partition to be mounted on with the command mkdir space forward slash mnt forward slash boot. And then mount the first partition you created as the boot partition by issuing the command mount space forward slash dev forward slash sda1 space forward slash mnt forward slash boot. Again, substituting the SDA1 with the first partition you created. With the Arch hard drive set up and all the file systems mounted, we can now set up your connection to the internet. If you're using a wired interface, it is as simple as issuing the command DHCP CD. This will use your network card to query your router for an IP address. If you're using a wireless setup, you will instead want to issue the command WPA underscore passphrase space, and then in quotes, your SSID, space, and then again in quotes, your WPA key. Then another space, the greater than symbol, space, forward slash etc, forward slash WPA, underscore supplicant, dot conf. Use the SSID and WPA key that correspond to your network settings. This will tell Arch what SSID your router is on and what passphrase to use when connecting. Then issue the command WPA underscore supplicant space dash uppercase D W E X T space dash I W LAN zero space dash C forward slash ETC forward slash WPA underscore supplicant dot CONF space and space greater than forward slash dev forward slash null. This should instruct the wireless interface on WLAN 0 to launch a client using the settings you specified previously. 
then issuing the command DHCP CD space WLAN 0 should connect your network via wireless using DHCP. If this fails due to a non-existent WLAN 0 interface, it is because you need to load the required kernel modules for your Wi-Fi card. Please see the wiki link in the description for more information on this. You should now have access to the internet. You can test this by issuing the command ping space dash c space 3 space google.com. As long as you get a ping back, your connection was successful. After confirming the internet, let's install the base system onto the disk by issuing the command pack strap space forward slash mnt space base. This command will install everything in the base package onto your system. You will next have to decide which bootloader you want to install onto your machine. You have the option of using SysLinux or Grub2. As of the date this video was recorded, SysLinux still does not support UEFI. However, both are fully capable of chain loading other bootloaders, which is required to dual boot Windows. Apart from those concerns, it really comes down to a matter of preference. I typically use Grub2, as I like to customize my system further with graphical boot menus. In order to install Grub2, issue the command packstrap space forward slash mnt space grub dash bios or packstrap space forward slash mnt space grub dash efi dash x86 underscore 64 depending on if you are using bios or uefi. If you would like to use syslinux instead you can issue the command packstrap space forward slash mnt space syslinux. Now that we have Arch installed, let's begin configuring the system. First generate an fstab file with the command gen fstab space dash p space forward slash mnt space greater than greater than space forward slash mnt forward slash etc forward slash fstab. This file is in charge of mounting all of the file systems needed on boot. Then we can print the file to the console in order to verify it was written correctly with the command cat space forward slash mnt forward slash etc forward slash fs tab. If you created a partition for your swap, you should notice the swap line is missing its device node. Begin editing the file with nano space forward slash mnt forward slash etc forward slash fs tab. Scroll down to the swap line and add the device node you used for swap to the swap line. To save an exit, use the keystroke. Control X, then hitting Y to confirm saving, and pressing Enter when asked for the file name in order to use the same file name. To proceed, change root into your new system with the command arch dash ch root space forward slash mnt. Once inside the change root environment, we will begin by setting the time zone. Time zone data is stored in forward slash user forward slash share forward slash zone info. You will need to find the subzone that applies to where you live inside the zone directory for the country you live in. Create a symbolic link to the desired zone and subzone. For me, this happens to be US and Pacific. For this, I will use ln space dash sf space forward slash user forward slash share forward slash zone info forward slash US forward slash Pacific space forward slash etc forward slash local time. Also remember this choice, as we will use it again later. In order to set up the machine to the appropriate locale, you need to first edit the file forward slash etc forward slash locale dot gen, and uncomment the two lines that correspond to your locale. For me, this happens to be en underscore us iso dash 8859 dash 1 and en underscore us dot utf dash 8. After confirming your locale is properly set, save and exit. Then edit the forward slash etc forward slash locale dot conf and set lang equals en underscore us dot utf dash 8 and lc underscore collate equals c. The last setting is so the ls command sorts by dot files, then uppercase, and then finally lowercase. Once finished, save and exit. Finally, generate the needed locales with the locale-gen command. 
Next, begin editing the forward slash etc forward slash rc dot com. First, set the hardware clock. This will either be blank or set to local time, depending on what your hardware clock is synced to at boot. If you're in a dual boot configuration with an operating system that is already managing time and DST switching while storing the time in local time, such as Windows, set this to local time. Otherwise, you can leave this option blank in order to use UTC time. Next, set the time zone. Use the same value that you symlinked to previously in the format of zone slash subzone. Then set the key map to the one you set up upon first booting the Arch installation. Since I didn't change mine, I will set this to US. Moving down to locale, we can set this to the locale we found in the locale.gen list. For me, this happens to be en underscore us dot utf dash 8. With the localization section finished, move down to the networking section. Set your hostname accordingly. If you are going to be using DHCP, set your interface to ETH0 or WLAN0, depending on if you are wired or wireless. If you would like to use a static IP address, you will need to fill out the other four options as well. I will set a static IP address just to show an example of the concept. With that set, save and exit. Now, because we statically set our IP address, we will need to edit the file forward slash etc forward slash resolve dot conf in order to specify a search domain and DNS servers. Add lines for your search domain and the DNS servers you use. I'm going to go ahead and enter my domain for search and Google's public DNS servers as the name of servers. Note that the DNS servers will be queried in the order listed. Then go ahead and save and exit. Next, open the forward slash etc forward slash hosts file. Keep in mind here that the FQDN, or fully qualified domain name, should be the first one after the IP address. All of the ones that follow will become aliases to the leftmost domain. Again, save and exit. And then install the initial RAM disk file system with the mk init cpio space dash p space linux command. With that done, we can now configure and install the bootloader. If you chose syslinux, edit the file forward slash boot forward slash syslinux forward slash syslinux dot cfg and specify the forward slash boot partition. Then use the command forward slash user forward slash sbin forward slash syslinux dash install underscore update space dash IAM to install syslinux to the MBR and set the boot flag. If, however, you chose to use grub2 like I did, you can run the config command with grub dash mk config space dash o space forward slash boot forward slash grub forward slash grub dot cfg. And then install grub to the first disk of your system with grub dash install space forward slash dev forward slash SDA. Your disk name may vary. The last thing you will need to do inside the change root is to set the root password. You can do this with the pass wd command. Then exit to leave the change root environment. With the system completely installed, unmount all of the partitions that you mounted for the installation. Issue the commands umount space forward slash mnt forward slash boot, and umount space forward slash mnt. Then you can go ahead and reboot the machine. Be sure to remove any installation media that you are using to install Arch. For recording reasons, I will leave mine in and then choose the option at the Arch Linux boot menu entitled Boot Existing OS. You should now see your syslinux or grub boot menu. If you're willing to wait the 5 seconds, Arch should boot itself. Congratulations, you have successfully installed Arch Linux. You can proceed by logging into the super user account named root with the password you specified in the installation. And that wraps up how to install Arch Linux. My name is Sean, also known as Kayo, and I hope to see you soon.